Cool. Um, so for those of you that sort of missed the first minute or two or came in a bit later, so I'm Vig, um, I'm an academic F2, currently at the Royal Free Hospital, and I'm currently on my medical education block. I'm Anthe, I'm an academic F2 as well, I'm currently on my urology rotation, I have my academic block next. Um, guys, do you want to jump in and introduce yourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm an F2. I'm working at Lister Hospital, which is in EBH, um, and my academic block runs out, runs throughout the whole year. So I'm just doing it throughout the whole year, basically. But I mean, I am working as well. It's like two days a week AFP and three days a week normal clinical stuff. Yeah, I'm Marinos. I'm a cardiothoracic surgery ST2 and also an academic clinical fellow in Leicester. Um, which means I spend 75% of my time doing clinical work and 25% of my time doing research. And I've been through the AFP in the past. Um, yeah. Cool. And I don't know if Angela's in the chat, but Angela is here. She's just um, yeah. uh, okay. Well, I don't know if she can hear us, but she, she's an IMT trainee who's just AFP in Leicester. Cool. Um, so who are we? So we're MedIQ or Med Medic Education. Again, we need to figure that out. Um, this is our sort of first course. We're hoping to do sort of a fair few education and teaching courses. So this is our first one is on how to get an AFP. Um, like I was sort of describing before, we've all sort of taught on and organized courses previously. But I think the reason that we came together to sort of do this was because a lot of these courses are sort of one day things that happen in September. We wanted to help you guys through an application throughout the whole process. Um, also, a lot of these courses are really expensive and we wanted to try and sort of create a course that helps you get onto an AFP without sort of breaking your bank accounts. Um, we wanted to widen participation and just teach as many of you as, you, as we can through this platform. Um, and yeah, just a general note before we get on with the rest of the, um, rest of the PowerPoint is that if you have any questions, just feel free to ask on the chat. Um, Marinos, Serena, Angela, we're all going to be watching the chat and I will try to as well. Um, and if there's any questions that pop up, then we'll interrupt the slides and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss those questions or just raise your hand. And again, um, I'll try and get to the question when I can. So just feel free to interrupt. This is meant to be interactive as possible. I don't really want to be just talking at you guys for an hour, hopefully. Um, so what we're going to cover today is just a quick review of sort of what we said last week. Um, and then the main aim of this talk is going to be about the application timeline. Um, a lot of you filled out our pre-course questionnaire saying that you wanted to know more specifics about the London application. Um, so Anthe and myself um, are both current London uh, academic trainees. And so we went through the application cycle a few years ago, so we can talk a bit more in depth about that. And we're going to talk a bit about the office system and just, again, go through some FAQs based off of the things that you asked us from last week's sort of feedback questionnaire. So we had about 10-ish questions on that. So we're going to go through that as well. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. So going just a quick review over what we talked about last week. For those of you that weren't here, um, the AFP stands for an Academic Foundation Programme. It's essentially a similar program to the foundation program as you might know it. So normally on a foundation program, you have six jobs that are all split up into four month blocks and those take place over the two years. An AFP essentially pulls out one of those clinical blocks and chucks in the academic block in whatever specialty or sort of interest that you have. Um, and those can be research um, interest, teaching, like I'm doing a medical education block or in leadership and management. Um, it's essentially just four months equivalent of protected time to do whatever you want. You're not timetable to do anything else. You're expected to maybe get some sort of output out of it, like a presentation or some sort of research project or teaching. But actually, the main thing is that it's an introduction to a lot of these skills to research, teaching, leadership and management. I mentioned that it's a, it's a sort of four month blog, but in some deaneries like Serena, she's at EBH, so Essex, Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire. So hers is sort of a day release scheme. So two days in the week, she's doing academic work and three days in the week, she's doing clinical work. There's currently about 600 AFP places in the UK. We think about one and a bit thousand applicants to these places. Um, and there's different sort of competition ratios that you can look up. Um, and in terms of what you would actually do, so I mentioned that this, these, these programs are all sort of research, teaching, leadership and management programs. 
So within that, you can do lots of things like lab-based lab -based projects, uh, clinical projects, running part of a randomized controlled trial, um, doing systematic reviews, simulation teaching, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of things that you can do. Um, a, a fair few people messaged us to ask. Um, so last week I did a slide on what my typical day as a medical education AFP was. Um, and again, for those of you that weren't there, the talk will re-record it. And so you can, you can have a look at that. But a lot of people asked us about a typical day on a research AFP. Angela, are you in the chat now? So the, yes. Angela's going to. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll just I'll, I'll click on the slides and Angela will talk through this bit. Yeah. Uh, just just load it all up. Actually, that might be easier. Thanks. Okay. So um, I did my project in dermatology at Leicester, and it was the first rotation of F two for me, and. The research part of it was basically writing an I IRAS application for a project looking at a prospective questionnaire study on patients with vitiligo and the aim was to um, identify sort of um, sort of outcomes that they wanted look, looked at in research that would have a benefit on their lives rather than what re what clinicians dictated. We were trying to find out what patients wanted us to look at because there's still a lot of unknown things about vitiligo and this this includes sort of doing a literature review, thinking about how you want to design the study and looking at sort of the benefits of different study designs, do, looking at ethics as well, designing the patient information leaflets and consent forms when you're recruiting patients, thinking about how we're going to recruit them from clinic and so on. And IRS is, is basically a computer application that gets submitted and I was basically responsible for filling that in by myself. Um, it was a lot of independent work but occasionally I'd meet with my project supervisor or with someone from clinical governance and so on, maybe once every couple of weeks but a lot of it was independent work. Um, as a, the, the, this project actually never took, never happened in the end because we struggled to get funding for it and then I think COVID-19 had an impact on research for, for everything that was non-COVID related but I still found this useful putting it in my IMT application mainly because in one, in my question about research I talked about all the different skills and experiences I gained from doing from doing this AFP and how that could like help me prepare for an ACF post in the future and to just or PhD and um, I did manage to present an interesting case at a national dermatology conference which is also good for um, future applications. It, then another part of my AFP was doing teaching, so teaching medical students on a regular basis and it was mainly on their clinical rotation but also in their in first year and final year medical students sort of giving lectures to the entire year group and through that teaching I sort of identified what the undergraduate dermatology curriculum which was relatively new at Leicester was lacking what students wanted more of and then I sort of created more material and did a quip on it and um and I also did a separate um se um, service evaluation project looking at um, cancellations in dermatology surgical list just as something else to add to more, my portfolio and then finally like I think a lot of people will do is sitting outpatient clinics and keep a logbook of interesting cases that demonstrates commitment there was a lot of flexibility on my rotor because I didn't have any on calls so I did a taste a week in rheumatology another specialty I'm considering I passed my MRCP part one at that time and preparing my portfolio for IMT applications because that's quite a big part of it and also making sure I'd done all my mandatory F2 courses that I had to do for the year because obviously it can be difficult getting study leave for it when you're on call in, uh, in your clinical rotations. So overall I would say that this AFP I almost had to create myself because there was nothing very definitely set in stone but but the, and sometimes it can feel like you're, you're wasting your time. There isn't much to do. It's very slow paced compared to working in a clinical job. But then the up upsides of it are that you can also gain so many soft skills that do look good on future publicate future applications. For example, one of the scenes that my supervisors were impressed with was that I demonstrated a lot of initiative when I when I started this AFP. And although there wasn't an this project, for example, my research project wasn't enough for the four months. I found other scenes to do as well. So I had quite a productive four months. Yes. Okay. That's it. 
Perfect. Cheers, Angela. Um, if anyone has any questions about that, then feel free to shoot on the chat or anything now or just interrupt us now. Uh, I think essentially, I mean, again, you'll see the sort of med ed side of it on the first week's talk when we record that. But essentially, it's basically four months off to do pretty much what you want. And I think most of our experiences have been reasonably similar that, I mean, I turned up to my FP and I met my supervisor on my first day. I didn't have anything sort of pre-organized or anything like that. And again, I agree with Angela. When I started, I was a bit like, oh, what am I doing here? But now I'm two months in and I feel almost as busy as I most days as if I was working on a clinical job. You find things to fill your time. And it's a combination of research, teaching and doing all the other stuff that you wish you could have done uh, while you were on your clinical jobs. So it just gives you loads of time to the things that you want to do. Um, cool. So hopefully that sort of covers a bit more about the research side of things. Um, so now we're going to move on to the sort of bulk of the, today's chat, which is the application process and sort of specifics of what goes on. Um, so just a very sort of broad, basic understanding of the foundation program and the AFP application. So this sort of map here is all the sort of deaneries and posts and things like that in the UK. So where can you apply? You can literally apply in the UK. The sort of terminology that you'll start seeing in the booklets is UOA and AUOA. So UOA is a unit of application. That's just the equivalent of someone saying a deanery, but it's a deanery for the foundation program. And AUOA is academic unit of application. And those are the AFP deaneries. The reason those are two separate things is because the deaneries are slightly different for foundation program and academic foundation program posts, which is a little bit confusing. So for example, for a foundation program post, you can apply to North Central London, South Thames and Northwest London. All of those would be three separate UOAs. However, an active foundation program post in the same hospitals that would be covered in these UOAs, they're all combined into this massive London, Kent, Surrey, Sussex, or London and South East AUOA. Um, so that's just something to be wary of is that the terminology that you might see might be different in different places. Um, so just be wary of that and look into which hospitals are in which deaneries. I think there's a website. Um, I, or even on the foundation program website, it tells you the specifics of which hospitals are, are in which deaneries. Cool. Um, so in terms of the application in general, so you apply for, when you're applying for the AFP, the maximum amount of AUOAs, I'm just going to call them deaneries from now on, the maximum amount of deaneries you can apply to is two. And then for the foundation program, you can actually rank all of them. Um, and so yeah, there's, there's no sort of limit to how many you can apply to for the foundation program, but for the AFP, maximum of two. And you apply for them at pretty much the same time by a web system called Aureal, which maybe some of you have heard of, maybe some of you haven't, but I'll come on to talk about it in a second. Um, we'd mentioned this briefly last week. So with a foundation program, the way it works when you're applying for those is that you apply for the deanery, then you get information about which hospital you might be at. And then after that, you get information about which jobs you might have in that hospital. And all of that sort of finding out specifically where you're going to be and what jobs you have comes mostly after finals. So like March, April time. So it's quite late on before you know where you're going to be um, starting that August. With an AFP, all the jobs should be published on the websites now. And in our newsletter, we put the links to all the different deaneries. So all the jobs should be published on the website and you'll know exactly which six jobs you'll have for the F1 and F2 year in advance. So when it comes to sort of picking which deaneries to apply to and then which jobs within that deanery, you can be really well informed about which places you want to apply to. And the big advantage of that is that if even if you're not interested in a specific AFP, we talked last week about how flexible all of these AFPs are. So even if you get one in hematology, but you're interested in rheumatology, you're often very flexible to sort of do a project in rheumatology instead. The reason that the other benefit of the AFP is you know which six jobs you have, so you can pick the clinical jobs that you have alongside. And there's a lot of clinical jobs that are offered in the AFP that aren't necessarily included in the FP. So things like neurosurgery, transplant surgery, um, other medical jobs that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, they are all included and you can, you can have a look at those. It's up to you how many jobs you want to rank within that deanery. So an example is that Yorkshire has 66 jobs. If you only like eight of them in terms of either the academic job itself or the other five jobs that come attached with it, you only need to rank eight. You don't need to rank all 66 and they'll consider you for only those eight jobs. Um, okay, 
a lot of people ask questions about the SJT. The SJT doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It isn't really taken into account in terms of scoring for any of the AFP application processes, as far as we know. They pre they make it pretty clear in the um, in their application booklets that you just need to pass the SJT and not sort of tank it horrendously, which literally pretty much almost everyone is fine with. So I wouldn't worry about that. Um, so what do the deaneries look for, if not the SJT and things like that? So the, the, the things that they commonly look for, and these are all things that we've compiled out of our own experiences. There's very few places that actually publish exactly what they're looking for. London is the exception, and we'll come on to talk about that. But in general, the things that you can sort of think that deaneries will look for are decile rank, so within your university, um, evidence of sort of research, teaching and leadership. And that's not always tangible things like publications or presentations. Sometimes it's just having experience of that that you can then write about in your white space questions. Um, probably the most weighty thing is actually performance at interview. Um, some places, I don't, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any, but some places ask you to bring a portfolio with you. Um, I didn't, I applied to Cambridge and London and I didn't have to do that. And by portfolio, I mean like a physical sort of like file of the things that you've done, etc. cetera. Um, you need a reference. So you need that for your foundation program and your academic foundation program. Um, so that's done automatically by your educational supervisors at university or your pastoral care supervisors or whatever you have in your university. But the main thing is that there's all of these sort of um, numerical things, but the main thing is it's you as a person. And that really only comes across in your white space questions, your interview, in terms of thing yourself, um, and all the other things are sort of to get you to that stage. There's a few things that I wanted to sort of just point out from the foundation program booklet. Also, we, uh, just before that, we had a question saying, can you choose who does your reference? Um, as far as I know, no, I don't think so. It's mo I, uh, at least at when I, where, I, where I was at UC, it was just our whoever we had as our clinical supervisor or like final year tutor for that year um, did our reference. You can definitely get in touch with your medical school to ask them who that person is and if it's possible for it to be someone else. But I don't know if that is possible or not. I don't know if anyone else has any experience with that. I think at bar you could choose who your supervisor is, um, but it needed to be within the same trust so you couldn't choose like a supervisor from imperial for example it needed to be within parts uh, but you could change it i'm not sure about other universities yeah i think the main point to make is that the re the reference yes is needed but I, I, in my opinion i think it is more of just sort of a checkbox exercise yeah. that basically says this person is a human who has been to medical school it's not like a flowing pros about how great you are or anything like that it's literally just something that this person exists and is applying for a foundation program post yeah. yeah um cool so hopefully that sort of answers your question um yeah so moving on to sort of new things for the for the application process that you guys will be going through um so the timeline's changed a bit and the next slide will talk a bit about that the decile scores um so because of obviously i'm sure all of you have been affected by covid and delays to your teaching and things like that so when i was applying we got our decile scores before we applied um so our university supplied us with whatever our epm score would be before we applied for our foundation program or academic foundation posts um that's going to be slightly different for you guys some of you might have already received them um the only thing is that medical schools have until the 14th of december now to confirm that hopefully most of you will have your scores anyway but just to be aware that now they don't have to get them in by the foundation program application deadline. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the special circumstances stuff, but the SJT is the other different thing. So again, the only thing that's different this year is that there's going to be two SJT sittings and both of them digital. So again, when I was applying, there was one big SJT sit uh, sitting that was in person. Everyone in the country did it at the same time. And then there was a sort of second mock up sitting for those people that were sort of out of country or something like that. Um, so all of the SJT things will be delivered digitally this year, just for you guys to be aware. Um, cool. So this is the sort of timeline that I've sort of put together quickly from looking at the AFP um, website and booklet. So by the 10th of August, which is two months ago now, pretty much, um, the AUOAs, so the deaneries, had to upload the details of the jobs onto Oriel. 
I don't think they actually met that. I think they did it a bit later than that. But anyway, all the jobs are on there now. And again, they're in our newsletter. Um, so if you're on our mailing list or just message us afterwards, if you don't have it yet, all those jobs and the lists of where to apply and stuff are all there. The application window is a fair bit longer than usual this time around. Again, probably because of delays with COVID. Um, so it doesn't open until the 19th of October, which is still a fair few weeks away. And it doesn't close until the 4th of November, which is a lot of weeks away. So you guys have got a lot of time to still think about your applications and get things ready, essentially. Um, from the 4th of November to the 8th of January is sort of the local deanery processes. Um, and that, again, I'll talk about in a second, but that's when people will be looking through your white space questions and your applications, and then you'll be in, uh, invited for interview. And the interviews will basically be concluded by the 8th of January um, in all deaneries. Um, by the 13th and 15th of January, that's when the first stage of AFP offers are released. And I think uh, the only reason I put this here is because you can see how much earlier you would know where you're working and what jobs you guys have got compared to if you were to apply for the foundation program when you only really find out in April, May. So uh, hopefully a lot of you by the 15th of January will know where you're going to be for F1 and F2. And then there's a cascade offers system, which is sort of second offers, third offers, et cetera, which I'll talk about later. Um, and yeah, that carries you through to basically the start of February. Um, 15th of February is the deadline to amend your foundation program preferences. So again, if you remember, I said you could rank all the deaneries for your foundation program. You can actually change which order those are in up until the 18th of February. So actually you can go through your AFP cycle, apply to certain deaneries, find out if you got an offer or not an offer and still be changing your foundation program preferences even after all, all your AFP stuff is done and dusted. Um, so yeah, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, fine. So Oriel, um, so Oriel is the online application system. Hopefully your universities will have been in touch about this or if not, you, they will be in the next sort of week or so. Um, it's a bit of a faffy website. Um, I don't think it's particularly the best application, so it's a bit confusing and they don't really explain how to use it. Um, but it's something that after spending an hour or two on it, you'll get used to. Um, you apply for both the foundation program and the AFP on the website. Oriel has a list of all the deaneries which you select from a drop down and it has all the jobs within that deanery. You don't have to wait to get your Oriel login to look at those jobs. Like I said, they're all on the deanery websites already. Um, so you can go and have a look at them and then basically just log on to Oriel and put those choices in. Um, what I would say is what I did was I took the list of jobs from the deanery website and just put it on an Excel sheet and then just sort of started deleting jobs that I knew I wasn't gonna apply to. Um, and then just started ranking them into like green, orange and red. And red was, I'm never applying. I really hate hematology, screw this. Um, I don't want to do this job um, and green were the ones that I obviously wanted to rank sort of higher um, but there is no tactical way to rank you can't a lot of people ask questions about sort of predicting how competitive a specific job might be so oh should I rank my surgical my academic surgery job at King's Hospital higher than my one at the Royal Free there's no tactical way to rank I'll talk about how the offers are sort of handed out in a second and hopefully that will explain why there is no tactical way to rank you just rank based on what you want to do and what your preference is. Um, on Oriel, you list all your achievements. Um, so all the sort of points stuff um, that goes into the AFP application, you list it on there. Um, and a good thing to start sort of thinking about now when the application window is a bit further away is just to list literally everything you, you can think of that you've done in research, teaching, leadership, management, everything. Just list it all, like sit down one day and write it all down. And I think that really helps not only for putting things on your Oriel application, but also for writing your white space questions for your interviews, et cetera. And you end up thinking like finding a lot of things that you would never have thought or never have remembered, but actually what well, after you spend some time on it, they do come up again. Um, all your application updates are received on Oriel. So if you get an interview, it will come up on Oriel. If you get offers, any anything like that will come up on Oriel. You'll get an email to your account saying, look at Oriel, something has changed. Um, but just be aware that if it comes to application day or whatever, and you haven't got an email, don't worry, go to Oriel first and check it there. Um, so yeah, the deadline is 4th of November at midday. Just, it's far off. Just keep that in the back of your minds. Um, and I just put, oh, sorry. Go on, go on. 
No, I thought, sorry, I thought you were done with the slide. Sorry? I thought you were done with the slide. I just wanted to jump in to answer one of the questions on the chat. Oh, fine. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm nearly done with the slide. So um, the, the last bit is um, about the achievements. I said you can list all the achievements and there's, there's slots for up to 32 achievements. Maybe, maybe someone has 32 achievements, in which case more power to you. Um, fair play. Um, but yeah, so there's 32 achievement slots. So it's two additional degrees and then 10 times three of publication, presentation, prizes, etc. Um, we'll talk about the specifics of what counts as a publication, what counts as a presentation in a bit. The reason I put that point in there is because I wanted to show you guys this table. Um, so this is for the foundation program. They unfortunately don't have one for the AFP. So there's eight. So this was, I think, last year, uh, there were 8,000 applicants. About half of them had an additional degree. 100 people had one publication and 36 had two. And if you go back to the start of the talk, I said there were 600 AFP places. I think the most common question I get is, oh my God, I don't have 10 publications or presentations, et cetera. Should I apply, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully this slide and this, these figures go towards reassuring some of you about that. Um, not many people in final year have two publications and things like that. You often only hear about the people that have 20 publications. And again, that's a great achievement. I'm not like saying anything negative or bad about the very impressive and great achievement but hopefully this shows you guys that the whole point of the AFP is an introduction to all of these things and you don't need to have all of them already um but yeah oh uh, Serena yeah do you want to jump in sorry yeah no just based on um all of these um achievements etc someone asked if we need evidence of uh teaching leadership things that you mentioned on your application and in your white space question and you don't need to bring any physical like portfolio or upload any physical certificates or anything from what I remember um, anywhere. But um, as Marinos and Angela said, you'll be applying for things for the rest of your career now. So this is a good time to start getting things in order. If there is associated paperwork um, or something like a portfolio you want to start putting together, now's a good time to, but you don't um, need it specifically for this application at AFP level. Yeah, so uh, in your in your like next level of applications, like your IMT, or, like medical training, surgical training, P training, you need to bring a physical portfolio with you with that sort of evidence. Um, and it's something that not a lot of people tell you when you're at medical school is whatever these things are, try and grab a certificate, try and get feedback for your teaching, etc. It's 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 a good it's good practice to start doing that from now because again, six months before or not six months, six weeks before your IMT application is not a good time to start sort of like compiling all of that you can do it but it will just make you stressed out so why not just do it from now um but i think they moderate about 10 percent of the applicants to the afp so about 10 percent of people that have applied will get an email saying can you provide evidence of x achievement um in most cases the publications things like that they're really straightforward to provide because obviously if, the, if it's published then you'll have and link to the other things like that um but yeah, just don't lie about anything outright. You can probably like twist things like you did on your CV, on your personal statements when you were applying to med school a bit. But yeah, try not to lie outright. Um, cool. We're going to talk a little bit about London applications. I'm sorry if this doesn't concern everyone, um, but we had a fair few people asking us specifics about this and both like a fair few of us are London trainees. So I thought it would be a good note to touch on. The other thing is, London's the only deanery that makes their entire point system public. Um, so even though this might not apply, so a lot, of, a lot of you might not be applying specifically to London, it's likely that other deaneries might use a similar sort of system, but their weighting might be completely different. So we don't know what sort of weighting the other deaneries apply to these things. Um, they definitely are different uh, uh, weighting systems because we know people who wouldn't have got a London interview who have got an interview elsewhere. Um, but yeah, just to be aware of things that they're asking, I'm going to go through the London system. Um, so London sort of, you apply, so you apply after you've listed all your achievements and blah, blah, blah. Then there's a process called long listing. Um, so where they sort of cut off X amount of people that have applied. Um, and they do that through decile scores and the decile score cutoffs are quite well published on their website for the preceding years really dumbly. And sadly, they don't publish the decile score for this year's application but you can see sort of a rough guide is that it's like third to fourth ish decile um so that's it's probably not going to go drastically up to just first decile only and it's probably not going to go drastically down to ninth decile as well 
So just to be aware in terms of your decile marks and things like that, it's roughly third to fourth decile for the long listing. Then the short listing is um, the next step. So this is again before interview. So this decides who gets to interview. The short listing is um, nine out of 20 points. Oh, sorry, okay, just to interrupt myself. Before that, so the, the decile cutoff in London is third to fourth decile. I know people who are in current AFP posts who are ninth decile in other deaneries who who apply to other deaneries and they're now in in their successful AFP posts. So even though the London one is third and fourth decile, that necessarily means the other deaneries are the same. By the same logic, other deaneries might be first decile only. Unfortunately, we just don't know, but it's a question we get asked all the time. So just to sort of really hammer that point in. So yeah, then the next step before interview is shortlisting. And London do this through assigning points for specific things. Um, the cutoff for when I applied was nine out of the 20 points. Um, they don't publish the shortlisting points every year. So I, go, I, I can only tell you what it was when I applied because they told me on my application. Um, but you can maybe, either we can message people or you can message people who applied the year above you. Um, to maybe see what it was. But again, I don't think it would drastically vary from nine points. Um, I think the year before me, it was like eight. So again, it's probably going to stay about the same. Um, 10 points are for degrees, extra degrees. And I'll, I'm, I'm just going to split this up and then we'll talk specifically about what these mean. So 10 points out of the 20 are for extra degrees. Five points are for prizes and 10 are for per presentation and publication. For some reason, they assign 10 points to degrees and divide the score by two. Sure, um, that's the way they do things. And then, yeah, so then it adds up to five, five, and then 10 to 20 total. And then again, you can see it on the London application booklet. They break it down really well into what exactly counts and what is a point. So if we start off with the extra degrees, which is this middle table here, the reason that it's out of 10, even though this sort of maximum is five, is for people that have two degrees. So if someone has a PhD or two PhDs, why someone would have two PhDs, I don't know. But that's the only way you can get 10 points. And even then it gets slashed down to five when they divide it by two. But it's just in case someone has a like a previous BSc degree and then a master's degree, things like that. But again, by that uh, application sort of stats summary that I showed you guys, only half of all applicants to a foundation program have an extra degree in the first instance as well. Um, the next thing is about prizes. So you get one point for each prize up to a maximum of five. The prizes are sort of undergraduate medical school um, level prizes. So say you were in the top 10% at your medical school, um, or if you've got a prize from a conference like best presentation or best poster, or you won an essay prize or something like that, then those are what count as prizes. Um, and again, we have a lot of questions about what specifically counts, and I'll come on to that in a second. Um, and then the third category is presentations and publications, which is up here. So you get two points for each research paper that you publish and one point for an oral or poster presentation um, that you present. So if it's the same, a common question that we get is if it's sort of the same research project that I presented as an oral and a poster presentation, then that means it's two points. You, so that counts as two separate points. Um, whereas if it's the same application, if it's the same, sorry, that was one of the consultants just walked past. Um, if it's the same research project and you've done it as an oral presentation twice, that's only one point. Hopefully that's clear, but if it's not, I can re-explain that. I might have done a bad job, sorry. Um, so all of that counts for a total of 20 points. And like I said, the cutoff was nine. If you meet this sort of initial criteria, then you're shortlisted for interview. I can't remember exactly how many people were shortlisted for interview in my year, I think it was maybe about 400 and there were, there's about 170, 180 jobs. So once through to interview, you have a reasonably good chance of getting a job at that stage. And again, the interview makes up the vast majority of your actual score. So it's 20 points for the initial bit, but actually the interview is double that. So it's 40 points. And when they add it up, it makes up two thirds of the whole score. So what, how you do an interview is more important than all of this stuff. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Ooh, where I put that? Okay, yeah, so if you don't know what counts and things, just put it down. 
as long as you're not sort of obviously lying and making up things like oh i presented this in, i presented this in 45 different places etc as long as you don't obviously lie and make it up and you do have evidence for it it's fine just put it down and it's not you to decide at the end of the day the deanery will decide what counts so if you're like sort of in the middle ground about something and you don't know whether it will count or not just put it down but be aware that they may well say no and that it might not count for your points so further down the line what counts as part of your application process so white space questions so this is something we're going to be talking about in a lot more detail next week when serena is um doing her white space question talk um some deaneries require you to answer sort of three to five short answer questions they're usually limited at 200 or 250 words per question there's not a mu not much space to fit things in um you submit them at the same time as the rest of your application so on aureal you actually you copy and paste if you, if you write them out in word you copy them from word to your aureal application and it's the same deadline so the 4th november at midday to submit your white space questions as well all the deanery white space questions are already available for this year and again they're in our newsletter which we'll send out etc uh, so all the white space questions are there so there's something to have a look at and get thinking about some of them are really really abstract um i think one of mine for cambridge was like what is the something about dark matter and it's like implications in medicine or something i don't know i made up some some yeah they need that question again yeah, so cambridge yeah they're really like oh let's ask them a really weird question that they'll struggle to answer but anyway um i don't know what they're looking for in those questions serena knows a lot more right. about it because she applied to exactly she, she applied to uh more places with white space question answers um but a lot of them the generic sort of format of the white space question is looking for it will basically ask you what is your evidence of research what is your evidence of teaching what is your evidence of leadership and management and then maybe one other personal question so it's really a chance to sell yourself in prose um, so that's where I said actually writing down a list of the things you've done can really help because you can draw from them into the white space questions. Um, then the next stage after all of this is interviews. And this is way down the line. So nothing to be imminently thinking about now. But almost all deaneries you go, uh, that you'll apply to will have an interview process. Um, the interview format differs between deaneries. And the second half of our course, our webinars starting in a month's time or so, will all be interfocused and will really be hammering in interview skills. The interviews generally will be focused on like a personal aspect, critical appraisal of a research paper, ethics and clinical scenarios. Um, so those are sort of the four broad categories and different deaneries will dip into each of those in different ways. Um, and our whole sort of second half of our course is going to be really in depth. And that's where the meat of what a lot of, our, a lot of the stuff we're going to be teaching you will be, um, because that is where the points are and that is where you can really make a difference um so yeah hopefully that outlines the application process reasonably to you guys um a few notes on your year's application process and I've, this all from the um afp sort of website almost all deaneries are going to have their interviews online this year i don't think anyone said they're going to be doing in person apart from i think it was east midlands maybe one place wants to do it in person um hmm. Um, but all, almost all of them will be online via Teams or Skype with video, so not just telephone, you need to have your video on. Um, another change that's uh, different from usual is that EBH are starting to offer research posts. So oh, prior to this year, all EBH, so Essex, Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire posts were all in medical education or simulation leadership and management. But from this year, they're starting to offer research posts. So again, that's something if you were interested in that sort of location more than anything, but in research, it's something encouraging for you guys. EBH aren't carrying out any interviews at all this year, as far as they've announced. Um, they are part of the same sort of mega deanery as Cambridge and Norwich, um, so East Anglia. And East Anglia and Cambridge are doing interviews, but EBH is not um, as of yet. So everything they say on the website is saying that they're not planning on doing interviews, but obviously they can just change that at last minute, but hopefully they won't. Um, they say that your entire sort of point scoring and whether you get an AFP or not is going to be purely based on your white space questions for the most part and perhaps a little bit on sort of application scoring. So the things we we're talking about like publications, DESL. But again, from knowledge of the EBH application, there are a lot more about your sort of personal characteristics and your personal experience over tangible things. Um, so probably more on the white space questions. 
Um, East Midlands Deanery this year are doing three specific AFPs in psychiatry, um, which is new to them as well. So again, there's not many psychiatry academic posts out there. So if you're interested in psychiatry, it's a good place to consider applying to. But otherwise, everything else is the same as usual. Um, Can I just cut in here, Big, about um, yeah, yeah, the East Midlands Psychiatry AFP? Yeah, go for it, Angela. So, so, it's, so I think this year it's being offered in Trent, which is North Midlands, sort of, like, not, not like Nottingham. But in my year of a black patient, it was about 2017, it was offered in, by Leicester slash Northern and was actually on this program and he had made like a, he had contacted a supervisor in Leicester had a project planned in place and then literally in the I think in the last couple of months of F1 he was told that this was no longer possible it had been cancelled because I because they weren't they couldn't provide it for some reason and he was asked to do a GP placement where he had to also do um, provide some service provision, do some teaching, and he ended up, and he wasn't allowed to do his original psychiatry project. And I think he managed to try and do, did something in community psychiatry, but it wasn't what he wanted, and he didn't get much of a choice about it. So um, it's just, I think it's a reminder that no matter what your contract your contract is, it's subject to change. And I think that if you ever read it all in the terms and conditions. It says that your offer is subject to change and to, to like service needs and so on. So yes, even if you apply for something, you may not end up doing it. And sometimes it can be very short notice as well. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, especially with like COVID going on. So um, it literally in the last week, and that's this is not just for oh what oh this is not just this is not just um for AFPs, but even for your normal foundation programs. There's a lot going on. I'm just gonna answer that. There's a lot of change going on, so a lot of people's um, a lot of people's app, um, posts are changing with very short notice. So even here, at, like at the Royal Free, um, all the people that were on Renal that were scheduled to be on Renal in two months' time have been told they're being shifted to ITU. So all of these foundation program posts and AFPs can be subject to change. Hopefully, they won't be, um, but it's just yeah, something to be aware of. Um, I'm just going to pause here for a second and answer some of the questions that are in the chat. I think Marinos and Serena are answering a lot of them anyway, but just in case people aren't reading the chat. Um, so Catherine asks, in the achievement section, you said we can provide three times ten things for publications, prizes and presentations. If you have more than ten of one of these categories and zero from another, is it better to balance them out? Um, so no, it's a maximum of 10 in each of those things. Um, so you can have a maximum of 10 publications, 10 prizes and 10 presentations. Um, it doesn't matter how they're split up really, point to points. Um, so it, it, you don't need to sort of like think, oh, I've got five publications, I need to have five of the others as well. Um, but it's a maximum of 10 in each one that they'll, they'll count. Uh, I think Marinos has already answered the question about degrees. Um, we've got another question from Suchi saying, if you're not the first author or presenter for a presentation, does that still count as a point? Yes, as long as your name is on the project somewhere, it still counts. Um, the first authorship and presenting and all that stuff maybe comes into more of an effect in the later stages of your application. So like in, when I say later stages, I mean later stages of your careers. Um, so when it comes to like registrar applications and things like that, and um, uh, or things like that it, it says specifically first author publications for the extra points but at this stage for the academic program if you're an author or on that with your name somewhere um we had another question saying where can we find the word limits for the white space questions um again the, if you go onto the afp website um there should be a thing that says white space questions 2020 2021 and they have the list of questions and the word the word limits for each deanery um, Again, that link uh, table is on our newsletter and we'll send that out again. Um, the other way, if it's not on there, is to either look at the Deanery website and they might have it on there. Or when you get the Oriel application, you can see the word limit on the actual box on Oriel as well. But in almost all cases, it's either 200 or 250 words, which I know it makes a big difference. But yeah, that's generally what it is. Um, okay. Uh, did I ha did did we have publications when you applied? Um, yeah, I had my BSc project published. So I did a BSc in third year. I had that published. Um, Anthony. Yeah, I had two maybe published from my BSc as well, but it doesn't. Yeah. 
And yeah. then loads of people applied and they had no yeah. publications. So it doesn't really Definitely. I, I like I think everyone everyone always hears about the people and knows about the people who have like again fifteen publications presented, whatever. Um but I guess it's a sort of like same same thing with like social media. You only see the good side of all of that. Like you don't you don't see the vast majority of people behind it. A lot most people applying don't have publications, things like that. I'll talk at the end of this. So that there's a specific slide I have about from today till the end of the application. What can you guys be doing to maximize points and things like that? And I'll talk about sort of publication points. So I had my BSE project published and then I think like the week before the deadline, I got something else published and I'll, I'll talk a bit about how we did that and everything. Um, but yeah. Uh, and I think Marinos and Angela have both said no the publications were after starting AFP. Um, Serena said, yes, she did have, but EPH didn't wait them at all, if at all, uh, didn't, didn't wait the publications at all. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your questions. Please keep them coming. And sorry if this is sort of a interrupted, stuttered talk. Um, but yeah, cool. We're going to talk about the offers process. Hopefully this is the happy end of things for most people. Um, it's a bit of a weird system to get your head around. So as I mentioned, you go through your sort of all your interview process, et cetera, et cetera. And the initial offers are given out on the 13th to the 15th of January. And the reason there's that range is you'll get the offer on the 13th, usually in the morning sometime. Um, and again, don't freak out if your friend from another deanery has got their offer and you haven't heard anything. Um, so like they take sometimes just some deaneries for some reason take hours to do something that they've had two months to be doing. Um, and yeah you'll get it later in the day so don't freak out I say that from personal experience um but yeah the reason I put the range 13th 15th here is because you'll get your offers on the 13th but with all AFP offers you have 48 hours to accept or reject the offer if the 48 hours lapse the offer is automatically rejected so you only have 48 hours. I know it sounds cruel but you only have 48 hours to accept the offer and so essentially don't leave it till the 13th of January to decide whether you want to take a job in that deanery or whatever um, try and think about it beforehand and try and think what would I do if I got this what would I do if I got that but that's further down the line the way the offers work are uh, so let's say you have a hundred pe uh, 200 people who've gone to interview um, after interview at interview they'll score everyone and then they'll add up your pre-interview scores and your post interview scores and then they rank all those people um, the highest ranked applicants are given their highest choice jobs so if you were ranked first of those 200 people, you get your first choice job. If the person who's ranked second has also ranked the same first choice job, they won't get that job because the person above them has gotten it. So they'll get their second choice job, if that makes sense. And they sort of just work down that system all the way until all the jobs are allocated. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So as I said, you have 48 hours to make a decision. Um, if you accept the job you're offered, you're removed from all other deanery applications and the foundation program process. So once you've accepted the job, you've accepted the job, that's it. All the foundation program deaneries will not know about your application. You won't be able to go back and say, I'm sorry for your mistake. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you will. But in most cases, they'll say, no, that's it. That's your job from now on. Um, and the re again, you'll be removed from all of the AFP deanery applications as well. So if you're, if you're lucky enough to have had two interviews and you're waiting to hear back, um, you wait until, say, like midday or later for the first day before you accept the job. Don't necessarily accept it straight away because, like I said, the applications from different deaneries come out at different times. Um, so, yeah, if you accept it, you might never find out that you had a, an offer from another deanery. Um, you can reject the offer in the hope for a better one from another deanery. Um, so not from the same deanery. So say I applied for a London job and I reject and London gave me an offer but for my 10th choice job that I didn't really want and I rejected it. I'll then be removed from the London deanery application completely, but I'll still be in the application process for whatever other deanery I applied for. Um, and I won't be able to, in the, in the second round of offers, get an offer from London again. So once you are out of the deanery, you're out. That's it. You're not getting any offers after that from that deanery. Um, if you reject the job, it will be offered to someone else. So again, going down that sort of ranking system, if you reject the job, 
then the person who was ranked beneath you who next wanted that job will get offered that job. And that's how the cascade system works. So there's three cascades to fill the jobs that are vacant and they sort of occur at like two weekly intervals. So the first offers are 13th to 15th of January. And so the first round of offers will go out and people accept or reject them. All the jobs that were accepted will be removed from the sort of offers uh, waiting jobs list. And all the ones that were rejected will be put back into the pile. Then for the second cascade, all the remaining applicants will be ranked by the same means. And then all the remaining jobs will be matched up, et cetera. And they do this until all the jobs are filled up. Um, and there's, I think, three or four cascades by the time they fill up all the jobs. Um, if you don't get an offer at all, you'll be kept in the foundation program process. So you're not going to just miss out on being able to be an F1 or F2. You'll still completely have the choice of the foundation program process. And we talked in a bit of detail last week about how you can do a lot of the stuff that we talk about in the foundation program. But the AFP is just a structured, supervised, protected to do all of that. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully that answers some of those questions. Um, that's sort of an overview of the whole application process, basically, from initially listing your points, whatever, to the white space questions, to the interviews, to the offer system. Um, this offer system, by the way, isn't just for London. It's for the whole uh, UK. Um, but yeah, hopefully that gives you a bit of a summary about that. Um, I'm going to talk through some frequently asked questions based off of the things that we've been asked over the last week since we did our last talk. Um, before that, I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat again, just to see what questions people have asked and see if we can answer them. Um, okay. So Catherine asks uh, about presentations. It says conferences uh, organized by the BMA or student societies will not count. So if we presented at a national conference organized by a medical school or undergraduate society, it doesn't count. That is correct. So it, it won't count if it's by an undergraduate society. It should be an official like um, society. Um, postgraduate. Postgraduate, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that and yeah, as Marinos says, that's the case with sort of all applications from here on forth. All sort of undergraduate references and stuff are really good ways to get introduced to people and get introduced to presenting in a sort of less uh, maybe stressful environment. Um, but unfortunately, they don't count for the application process. Mm -hmm. um, how much say do you have over your research project? Um, so Ishbel asks. Uh, so I'll talk about medical education quickly for a second, and then someone else can jump in about the, re the other side. But number one is whatever AFP you have, usually there's a lot of ability within it. Some people um, have email the supervisors before the application, before they even have interviews, and start to look at what projects they want to do. Myself, I basically wanted to email my supervisor and then COVID happened and I'm, I just got reasonably lazy and I didn't meet my supervisor until the day I started. Um, and we sat down and had literally like a three hour conversation about all the stuff that I'd done, what I wanted to do. And she basically shaped what I'm doing for my next four months um, and the research projects and put me in touch with the relevant people based on that discussion. So I personally think I had a lot of say in my research project and I want to do surgery going forward. So I'm actually doing a project in surgical education. So I've been able to shape my research a fair bit. Um, and I know other trainees here in London and also outside. So I've got friends, uh, a friend who's doing his AP now in um, Leicester, Northamptonshire, and he's doing a radiology AP. And he's basically just said, I don't even want to do it in Leicester. I've met this, I've seen this person in Nottingham who once who I really liked. Can I go over there? And they've said, yes, whatever, as long as it's a research project. The converse of that is that some people, their supervisors will expect them to do a sort of project that may be a, may be a smaller part of a bigger project. So sometimes you get given a project that's part of a PhD student's project. Um, and so they might expect you to do that. So you have to do that research project, but you'll still have the freedom and the time to do other research projects alongside it. So I'm doing a surgical education project, my med ed AFP, but I'm matching other non-med ed projects alongside, and I just have the time to do that. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in about their experiences. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I basically don't um, uh, have a supervisor. Um, so EBH pretty much leave it down to you um, to make contacts. There are people in the hospital who are quite, so I'm doing medical education and there are people in the hospital who, like doctors who are quite heavily involved. So it's just about reaching out to them 
and working out what you want to do, or you can be completely independent. And in my case, developing teaching programs or developing online resources or trying to help the undergraduate teaching curriculum because we have UCL and Cambridge students at Lister, so it's quite easy to do that. So it's completely independent um, what you want to do. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, um, what sort of proof would people want for a poster presentation, etc.? Um, I think Suji's answered her own question. A certificate is perfectly fine. Um, or like a, a, a booklet of like the programs so if you presented at a conference, there's often like a program that has uh, the list of what posters there were with your name next to it. Um, so something like that's fine. Or just like a letter from your supervisor in the project, anything really that's sort of tangible, um, that isn't too shifty, that doesn't look like you made it on paint. Um, can you, uh, so Isabel's asked, can you hold an AFP offer waiting to find out about FP offers? Um, no, because FP offers come out later than the AFP offers. So the last AFP offer sort of cascade is late February or early February, sorry. Um, whereas the foundation program offers only even begin to come out in March or later. And so the AFP process is all mocked up and done by the time the foundation program stuff even starts. Um, so unfortunately not, it is a sort of, it is a big annoyance because I think a lot of people, myself included, are like, oh, should I do this, should I not, sort of on the fence. And it's difficult to make a decision without knowing what might be. But in general, I'd say if you get an AFP offer, personally, I would just take it because you, it just gives you, there's so much flexibility in what you want to do, unless of course there's a location you definitely don't want to be in. Um, okay. Yeah, that's it. Fine. Okay. Um, a lot of the FAQs have already been answered uh, right now, but one of the questions that I got was, what is a foundation priority program? I don't know if people would have heard of these or not. Uh, I, they didn't exist when I was at medical school. I think they started last year. Um, they've basically been developed to specific areas in the UK that have found it difficult to attract unis applying or specific specialties that have found it difficult. So things like psychiatry, of psychiatry foundation priority programs uh, because they're struggling to recruit people for psychiatry training um, you can apply for an FPP alongside your other applications as well um, so you can apply for one FPP alongside your normal foundation program and your two AFP deaneries the difference between the two uh, what between an AFP and an FPP is that an FPP is a three-year program um, they have specific leadership and management and teaching program sort of years within that, which are not the same as the academic foundation program equivalents. The specifics of that, I'm not too sure because I haven't researched into all the individual foundation priority programs, um, but they say that they're very different from the AFPs. Um, in terms of where they are, this is probably the biggest point, is that they're usually in sort of less popularly applied areas or more rural areas but they're designed so that you won't move around too much. So once you're in an area, you're in that area. There's often a lot of financial incentives attached to a few of them. So I think for the psychiatry one, you get an extra five grand or six grand a year, um, depending on where you're working. There's a chance to have additional qualifications. So you can, there's a chance of getting a postgraduate certificate or a master's. These also exist in a fair few AFPs. So Serena's EBH medical education one um, comes with a fully funded PG cert um, course as well. Um, and then the, I think, unique thing as well is that there's a lot of digital health and entrepreneurship posts, um, which again, I'm not sure how different they are to a leadership and management AFP, um, but just so you guys know that this also exists. Uh, um, what happens if I don't get, if I get an AFP I don't want? I think I've already talked about this. Um, it's very common. Um, not everyone gets their first choice AFP. I'd say the majority of people don't, um, but most people stand up accepting whatever choice they get. Um, and like I said, apply to the ones that you know that you'll take. There's no point applying to an AFP that you know you definitely don't want and putting in all that effort. Um, like I said already, the AFP is reasonably flexible. So even if you get an AFP that you don't want, you can have a chat with your supervisor and see what projects. Um, some deaneries allow swaps between AFPs as well, but you'd have to email the specific deaneries to find out. Is there a decile cutoff for insert deanery here, deanery? Um, I've already talked about London and I've already said that they're, they are the only ones that really publish their decile cutoff. I say apply smart because my only thing about London applications is probably don't, they're, they're, the, they're the only times I would discourage people from applying 
is to an AFP is if you're clearly outside the decile cutoff for London. I can't predict what it would be this year, but my opinion would be that if you're not sort of in the top half, um, again, that's just anecdotal, but if you're not in the top half, then maybe consider putting your application and your time to another deanery. Um, the AFPs offered in most places are very similar and you'll get a very similar research experience and introduction to a lot of these things. Obviously every hospital, most of them have medical students, so you'll get teaching experience almost everywhere. Um, so don't worry about missing out on things, just think about where you're likely to get into. Um, not all deaneries have a cutoff, as I've said. Um, we know people who are first SL who didn't get an interview and some in ninth SL who did and then went on to get a place. Um, again, just reassurance for you guys. Um, what counts as a point for presentations? So these are some specific questions we got. So if I present the same project, which is once oral and once poster, do I get points from both? Yes, and they've said that here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Hopefully that's pretty clear. Um, is oral considered more highly than poster? No, it doesn't matter. Um, they're both the same. Uh, do I get points for presentations if my name is on the project, but someone else presented? I've already been over this, but yes, um, you just need to have your name somewhere on there. Um, do they only consider proper professional societies or a national or international level, or is an undergraduate conference also accepted? No. So I think I've already answered this. Oh, sorry. Um, so essentially it has to be a professional or postgraduate society or a national or international conference by them. And they're all the sort of bits in the booklet that I picked out that you guys can have a look at on these slides later if you want to. Um, what counts as points for publications? So it needs to be in a peer reviewed journal. Peer reviewed just means that when you submit something to the journal, they'll usually get one or two people who are sort of knowledgeable or experts in that field to read your paper. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll instantly reject it or things like that. They often, the process often involves them reading your paper and then giving you constructive feedback to then rewrite parts of your paper and resubmit. Um, so that's sort of just like an extra step in a journal's submission process that prevents bias and just like completely anything being submitted to a journal and being accepted. So it needs to be in a peer reviewed journal. You can find out whether it's peer reviewed or not. If you go on a website, and then just like click the submission button and it will literally say, we will peer review this or do you have like, it will talk through that whole process there. Um, almost all journals are peer reviewed. If it's got a PubMed ID, it usually will be a peer reviewed journal. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. You need a PubMed ID for your publications. There are journals like things like set up by, for example, student societies that have journals or the Royal College of Surgeons that has a journal um, but those don't have Pub, PubMed IDs. Um, PubMed is a database where all sort of papers and things um, and journal articles will get uploaded to. Um, you can type in PubMed and have a look at it later if, if, if you haven't seen that already. Um, but it needs to have an ID. Um, and that basically means when you submit to your journal, the journal will publish your paper on PubMed database. So that infers that the publication must be sort of over and done with. So when you're publishing something, you submit the article. It often takes a few months sort of back and forth between you, the peer reviewers, et cetera, to get something actually pushed through to publication. Um, and then after that, they'll submit it to the database. Some people have their uh, articles accepted, but they're not actually published to the database yet because there's a bit of a delay. That usually means that they're in press, which means that either they're like pre-published as like an online article, but they're not done the physical journal yet, or it's published in the journal, but not on PubMed yet. Um, you get something called an NLM ID, um, which again, you can have a look at on the journal's website to see if they do this thing. Um, and if, if they have that, then that's an equivalent as well. So if you guys have something that's sort of in the works of being published, have a look to see if it has an NLM ID. And if it does, then it will count. Do they prioritize quality of publication over quantity? Nope, no one cares about quality of the publication um, for your applications. Obviously they'll might ask you about it at your interviews, in which case you need to sort of know about them and hopefully stand up for your publication. But yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, the impact factor, things like that don't really matter. Um, is it okay if I have zero publications, presentations and prizes? Yes, completely. I've shown you guys all the stats already about how many people applying for a foundation program have these things. And we've talked through our own experiences of how many of us have these things. Um, and how many of our friends do. So most people don't. Um, it obviously does help for certain places. It, it does sort of push you towards maybe getting an interview. Yeah, it's not essential. 
Um, again, apply smart. So you guys, I told you what the cutoff is for London um, for the points and stuff. I doubt it's going to change drastically. If you don't think you'll hit that cutoff, apply smart and apply somewhere where you think you'll still have a good time, learn a lot, do a lot, but where you'll stand a chance of getting an interview more. Okay, big slide. What can I do to boost my application before the deadline? So 4th of November is still a long, long, long time away. Don't worry, it might seem like it's looming near, but it's not. It's a long time away. Um, teaching. So again, teaching might not count for specific points on your application, but in almost every white space question for deanery, they ask about teaching experience. If you haven't done any, that's fine. But if you can, I mean, you guys are mostly fifth or final year um, or graduated medical students. You have to younger year medical students or other professionals around you, um, ask them what they want to be taught or go to your medsoc and ask, can I do a teaching session, etc. Um, and it's really good to draw experience from that for your white space questions. Everyone's already touched on this, collect evidence. And this is not just for the AFP application. This is literally for life. I wish someone had told me this a bit earlier in, when I was at medical school. Um, I did some teaching and things like that. And just, I, uh, I can't remember what it was now because I don't have evidence of it. And it's just impossible to go back five years later and ask someone for a certificate for something you did in second year. Um, so collect evidence as you go. Um, and by evidence, I mean either a certificate saying you've done the teaching, um, feedback, so create a feedback form like we've done for our lectures on Google Forms and use that as evidence for your teaching. Um, and a really key thing that I think, again, helps in later stages of your application, so like core surgical, medical, things like that, is to reflect on your teaching and then to basically just look at your teaching, look at your feedback, think what is, what is the feedback, what can I do to improve this? and then change your teaching and then recollect the feedback. So do have that sort of cycle so that at your interview, you can say, oh, I thought actually I did this teaching and someone told me that this was really crap. So I thought about how to change it. I went back and I did the teaching with a different group of students and I asked specifically about the change I made and people said this. Um, and that sort of cycle is what people want to see when you're at your interviews and stuff. Um, publications. Um, so this is the little sort of secret that I was talking about. So I mentioned that um, I mentioned that when I applied, uh, I had my BSc publication, and then I sort of snuck in another publication just before the application deadline. Um, so this is what uh, this, so I wrote a letter along with Serena, um, which is the, this letter. I, I, I share the title not so that you guys can go and read the letter, but because we found it really funny. Um, but a letter is essentially a short sort of 500 word response to an existing article um, or your own sort of take on an issue that you feel the audience of that journal would like to know about. Sorry, I've misspelled no there, uh, would like to know about. Not all journals um, publish letters, but almost all of them do. So if you guys want to publish a letter, the first sort of start is to identify a journal that in a field that you're interested in. So for Serena and I, we're both doing medical education AFPs. We found a medical education journal called like Medical Education Online, I think. Uh, and we went and read some of the articles. We thought, could, can we reply? Mm. And then think that we couldn't, like we didn't have any sort of unique takes on any of the things that had already been published. So we went off and did our own sort of experiences of sexual treatment because our like, heavy blocks of um, taking was a nap. We just wrote word like being like that are in the literature about sexual history taking this is something that our medical school needs to consider I felt and it was like well, it's super easy and the reason it now is because from the moment we thought about doing a letter when it actually got published and like we wrote it and got published was a matter of weeks maybe I think it was um, I think they responded. I think they emailed us in a week to say, thank you, it's been published. Yeah, it was insane. Like, <laughs> we, we sort of just did it on like a whim being like, oh, like maybe we'll give it a go, blah, blah. And then like, we, wrote, we wrote this letter and a week later it, was, it, was, it had a PubMed ID. Um, so you guys still have time to do something like this and like pick up these points. Um, a letter usually only counts, so it, it will only really count for the early stages of your application. I think people realize for things like core surgical or I, um, medical training that sort of anyone can really write a letter and just publish it. Um, and so they don't take these into account for later stages of your training um, necessarily, but it, it will count for your AFP. So if you want to, then go ahead and do this. Um, another quick thing you can do is a case report. 
Um, so again, have a look at journals. So if, you're, if you've seen a particularly interesting thing when you're on your placements or you remember something interesting, approach the consultant and ask them if you can write a quick case report. Case reports, again, are no longer than 500 to 1,000 words most of the time. And it's basically detailing the history and like unique learning points. And again, they can be quite quick turnaround as well. Um, you can do a very quick audit or presentation if you have a chance. So if, if you, if you want to like sit down and smash out like a week's worth of data collection for an audit and then try and present it locally somewhere, um, or if there's a conference coming up, because a lot of these conferences are online, so their application sort of deadlines are um, not the same anymore. So you might have time to do that. Um, and then another sort of way to hunt for points in these last few weeks is looking at essay, oh, sorry, essay prizes, um, or sort of look at your own medical school to see if they have any prizes on offer. Um, a really good place to look is the RSM website, it's the Royal Society of Medicine website. Check your university emails. I remember when I was at med school, I constantly got spammed every week being like, oh, X society has an essay prize. Um, so all of those will count. Um, or have a look at the Royal College of whatever specialties website as well. So um, look at the Royal College of Surgeons website, look at the plastic surgery website, whatever, whatever specialty you're interested in, have a look at their website and they often have loads of essay prizes and hopefully one of them's deadline um, will be in time for the uh, AFP. Leadership and management roles, again, nothing quantifiable in most deaneries, but if you sign up, especially now at the start of the year, to a society committee or volunteer to be a, med, uh, a representative or whatever, um, you can talk about that in your white space questions as well. Hopefully that's a sort of like whistle stop, what can I do in the next six weeks sort of thing um, for you guys. Uh, I know not, not all of it is sort of tangible points based things, um, but they're all very important in your application process. Um, last few minutes on sort of your next points, and I've already talked about this last week, is what do you want to consider when you're applying? Um, so look at the types of AFP, what the other specialties are, and whether there's any sort of unique special that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. The location, so the AFP is just a free second chance at wherever you want to be. Um, so have a look at that. Um, try to talk to prior trainees. So over the course of the last week, we've been trying to put people in touch with um, people that we know who are in that block. But unfortunately, we don't know all 600 AFPs in the country. Um, a, a way that people have got in touch with me in the last year or so is that they email the deanery or they email the hospital. So you can you obviously you have access to all the hospitals and the posts. You can email the postgraduate medical education team at that hospital and then they will try and put you in touch with the current AFP in that job. How a lot of people have gotten through to me. So the postgraduate medical education team usually have their own websites and things like that. So you can find that out um, through there. But obviously, if we can help you guys with people that we know, then hopefully we can do that. Um, your next steps in the short term is to look at sort of the deanery websites and look at the jobs that are on offer. Um, write down a list of all your achievements um, and start ranking the jobs as well. And mainly speak to existing AFPs if you have the chance. Um, and then long term, I'm not going to talk about, but it's basically interview. Um, this is our first newsletter. Um, just to talk through it. So this is all the AFP links and then this is all the deanery specific links. Hopefully you've all got that. Um, and then just the last minute talking about our course. Um, so we're on the second week now. So the application process side of it. Next week will be writing white space questions. And then our final week will be just a whole sort of Q&A, us talking about our applications and just babbling for a while. Hopefully it's useful to hear our experience of our applications for you guys. And it's reassuring, hopefully. Um, so that will be a week where you guys will be sort of getting to the stage where you're running white space questions, applying for things, and you might have more specific questions you can come back to us about your applications with. Um, so those will be the first few weeks of the course. After this, um, we're going to be doing a, like further eight webinars, which is all over here, starting from when your um, application deadline is. Um, and that will be very interview focused. So the interview, like I said, is the main part of your AFP application. Um, and so we're going to be sort of slamming you with information about how to successfully prepare and be good at an interview, especially in a time when it's all sort of online interviews. Um, we'll be charging a small fee. I, meant, I mentioned at the start, there's a lot of these courses that charge hundreds of pounds. I could think of one example of a day course that charges 200 pounds, but probably a lot, lot, lot less than what we're offering. Um, obviously, we, we, 
we need to cost of things like the website for Zoom, et cetera. So we're going to be charging a small fee for that set of eight webinars, but we're going to be offering you guys one-to-one -one mock interviews, white space question checking, those things as well, uh, in addition to just these webinars as well. Um, and it's going to be a lot more personalized support than you get with other courses. So hopefully you guys can see why we need to charge for it. Um, and it's basically the, the price of like a really expensive London coffee. Um, but yeah. Um, next session's going to be on white space questions and Serena is going to be leading that one. Um, the priest course newsletter might include some homework about starting to write your white space questions. Um, and we're going to spend the entire session talking about a structure, what to include, what not to include, things like that to get you started in the next few weeks on your application process. Um, so that brings me to the end of the talk. We'd really, really, really appreciate it if you could fill out the feedback. Um, obviously, we've spent some time doing preparing all these courses and things like that. And like we've said, we need evidence um, or, or we ain't getting jobs for ourselves in the future as well. Um, so please fill out the feedback. And in the feedback, there's going to be, there's a bit at the end which says, what do you want to know? What I missed out? What do you want to know for next week, et cetera, et cetera. So please just spam that with questions and it will form the basis for all the FAQ question um, in the next week. Um, while everyone's doing that, I'm just going to look through the chat again to make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, okay. And please, yeah, keep asking questions or just turn on your mics and ask questions in the meantime. Uh, da, 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 da. Can you apply to different deaneries for every application? Um, so for the program, you can apply. So, so this is a question from Ishbel. Um, so for the foundation program, you can you can rank all the deaneries. Uh, so that's the normal FP job. You can rank all the deaneries. Um, and then the specific jobs and stuff you pick later, sort of in the March, April time. Um, and that's a local process. So whatever deanery you end up getting into will contact you saying these are the jobs, apply locally. Um, for the AFP, it's a maximum of two deaneries. Um, so you can apply. So for example, I picked to apply to London and Cambridge and I ranked in Cambridge, I think there were like 20 jobs and I ranked five or six of them. And in London, there were 180 jobs or something. And I ranked like 30 of them that I wouldn't mind doing. Um, so yeah. Um, do letters count as publications? Yeah, so hopefully I've answered this. Yes, and they need PubMed ID. Um, can you locum during AFP? Yes, I'm locuming this weekend. Um, you definitely can. General rule of thumb as an F1 or F2 is that as an F1, you can locum within your trust. Again, don't quote me on this, check with your trust when you start. Um, but as an F1, you can locum within your trust. And as an F, you can locum anywhere. And in general, only locum in specialties that you've already done. Um, probably a wise thing to do as well. You wouldn't really want to be doing a cardiology locum having never done a cardiology job. Um, but yeah, you can definitely locum. Um, okay. Oh, he says he's asking for a mate. Fine. Cool. Um, <laughs> fine. Would abstracts that are published and have a PubMed ID count? Good question. Um, I don't think so. Off the top of my head. Does anyone know? If not, you so. You mean abstracts? For from, from conferences, yeah. From conferences. Do you mean like when, if, if, if it, it, like if you have an abstract at a conference and then the conference publishes a booklet of the abstracts, is that what you mean? That definitely counts. That does, yeah. Towards presentations. I have an abstract that was published by the BJU. It should count. It should count. It should count. It should count, yeah. Yeah. It should. Um, yeah. At the same time, just put it in. Yeah. Exactly. So, like, yeah, uh, what I said before, if you're unsure or you're on the fence of things, just put it in. As long as you're not, like, actively lying, they'll decide if it counts or not. Um, and I think, I mean, they probably, I don't know how much time they actually spend looking at, like, individual people's points and things like that. But I would say that if you have a title, your name on something, and a PubMed ID, it's probably enough to, to say so yes. What I... they do is that they've got an administrator of some sort that uh, pastes their PubMed ID into PubMed and validates that your name uh, shows up with that PubMed ID. I don't think they do any more quality control than that. 
Yeah, so make sure you copy and paste the PubMed ID correctly because they only, you know, they copy and paste it on PubMed and it, if it comes up as error or something, they don't look into it more. So they just copy and paste it and if it comes up with your name, then they count it. So just be cautious. Cool. Um, has anyone got any other questions? We'll, we'll stick around for another five, 10 minutes-ish um, to answer any questions. And not just about the application. If anyone has any questions about us, our days, what, what we're doing, feel free. <laughs>